It's my pleasure now to introduce Erin Hanlon to you all. Erin is currently a PhD candidate at Auckland University of Technology in Auckland, New Zealand. As a direct entry trained home birth midwife from the US, she's worked in a variety of practice, educational research and funding roles within the United States and New Zealand. Her master's in public health focused on equity issues for people with physical impairments and reproductive health screening. Erin's current research is looking at the changes in New Zealand's maternity system over the last 30 plus years relating to education, practice, governance, and funding. In addition to her doctoral studies, Erin is currently working in health research funding within New Zealand's largest clinical facility, Auckland Hospital. Erin, just tell me when you want me to switch slides. Okay. So firstly, thank you so much for being here and taking the time out on uh, International Midwives Day to listen to me talk about my um, PhD findings. Um, now this, I have four chapters of findings and this is uh, one section of the first chapter of findings. And so it's, it's very brief and there's a lot that I really can't go into, um, but I appreciate you being here. So uh, next slide, please. We need to kick off with a huge grateful, I'm so grateful to my supervisors. I don't know if I can't see Susan on there, but she's in the chat. So that's great. Um, she's my midwifery supervisor and Charmaine Bright is my methodology supervisor. I should also mention associate professor uh, Andrea Gilkison, who was very helpful uh, getting this project off the ground early on. Next slide for us. Well, I'm getting tied up. Uh, Tana Koto Katoa, co um, Irish, Italian, Polish, American, Te Faka Papa Rangi Mai Ingiri, Co Encinitas, California, Te Fenoa Tupu, He Ao I Te Toko Tu Mai Auckland, Me Te Fatu Ora, Co Aaron Hanlon Toko Ingawa, Tena Tato Katoa. So this is my pet beha, essentially what I'm trying to convey as a non-Indigenous New Zealander is who I am and connect with you. Um, at the very far top corner is me and my direct entry midwifery. My supervisor or my preceptor, Sharon Hamilton, is below me. And this is at a primary unit in Hollywood, uh, Florida. Um, and I think it's the blue room and that was me in my third year doing a primary birth. Then just below that is at a hospital very close to Hollywood Birth Center, just down the road. And this isn't actually in a theater. This is a standard delivery room. And this was a, a standard vaginal birth. Above on the other corner is me with Ina Mae Gaskin, who is my spark bird of getting me into midwifery. Um, reading her book helped me to determine that I wanted to also uh, become a midwife. And then below that, which I can't see, is a picture of um, me with my first born daughter at home doing her first bath. Um, that was a planned home birth. And next slide for us, please. So my research question essentially is how has the Nurses Amendment Act in 1990, how did it shape contemporary New Zealand? So as Cecilia mentioned, my research is looking over the course of 30 years. Um, and with the Nurses Amendment Act, why am I talking about that? What does that mean? Essentially, this act is what allowed uh, autonomy for midwives in New Zealand. It allowed midwives to practice without having a doctor present. And the act really just changed. It added three words um, or registered midwife. But then actually what happened is there were five other acts and 22 uh, sets of regulations that also needed to change in order for to provide midwives with a scope of practice. So what is the Nurses Amendment Act and why did we have it? Essentially, it allowed the direct entry midwives, um, like I said, to practice without a doctor, but why did we need that? I'll talk about that in a moment. And also it gave um, health consumers or 
uh, service users uh, or patients or clients, whatever we call women who are pregnant, having a baby or people who are pregnant. Um, it gave them choice of who they wanted at their birth, but also where they wanted to have it. It allowed for continuity of care and also informed consent. And we can go to the next slide, please. So why did the law need to change? Uh, well, several reasons. Um, I like I put pay and equity there because that's an ongoing uh, continuous uh, issue. But if we look at the midwives compared to some supportive GPs, midwives were paid $25 to attend the labor and birth. They were paid for three antenatal visits at $4.50, and they were paid $5 for uh, the postnatal visits. Um, when consumers and the midwives talked about supportive GPs, in the main, they said that a supportive GP who attended a birth would sit in the corner with their hands in their pockets or sit in the corner and not do much or be there in name only. Um, and that is mostly what they had said. Can we go to the next slide, please? And But in addition to that, and I have this slide to show the purpose-built um, pathway, essentially, which represents the institution of the hospital and the barriers that were there. And then we have the side pathway, which this is called um, sort of a design flaw of the, the architect, essentially, um, which shows that the user is going around the system to to use it in the way that they would like to. And the hospital had barriers. They would didn't allow... Um, people to bring their partners. Uh, they had very rigid ways of practicing. Um, it, it just, it wasn't very nice for women. Some of the, uh, one of the participants said that the, the morphine, or the drugs that they were given to women were so port, potent, excuse me, that this woman woke up sort of out of a stupor and was patting her tummy. And she's like, oh, I, I had the baby already. And she hadn't realized that she had had the baby. And the baby wasn't in the room. It was off in the nursery. So it was really surprising to them about just the way that the hospital procedures were. Some of the consumers also talked about that they didn't just have to find a midwife, but they also had to find a supportive GP. And that was very difficult. So some consumers were calling midwives and saying, I'm not pregnant yet, but put me down for next month. I'll be pregnant next month because they didn't want to not have a midwife looking after them to provide a home birth. Um, also, the word midwife was taken out of the language or people didn't know what it was. Everyone would call midwives nurses. And so one of the participants was saying that they'd go down on Friday night around the mall and they'd say to people, do you know what a word midwife means? Do you know what a midwife is? And so they were doing these midwives and consumers were doing a lot of education. And then they started doing antenatal classes to um, to encourage health literacy for patients and things like that. The other thing that was not happening is that we didn't have a continuity of care model. So when people would go into labor, they'd go into the hospital and the hospital, as I said, was quite rigid in the way that things happened. There was a shave and enema and it was all very structured. Um, and what was I going to say about that? <laughs> And they they wanted to know who was going to look after them. So some of the participants were saying that the only way for them to know who was going to be at the birth and to know that their voices would be listened to was to have a home birth. We can go ahead and change that slide. Thanks. So my research is really, I'm using a narrative inquiry, which is a methods and a methodology. And I'm not going to go into this too much because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. But it's really looking at the person's story to gain insights into this phenomena. Um, the participants are sharing their reflections and their experience with the um, benefit of hindsight. And these individuals had privileged knowledge of how the profession developed. And I will talk about who they are uh, soon. Uh, next slide, please. Which actually we can probably, the, the methods are very similar to most qualitative um, research, so I don't really need to talk about this. 
So next slide, thank you. So the ethical justification that I needed to provide for getting ethics, what I did is I directly contacted my participants. Um, I will be naming them for perpetuity because we have heard a lot about the uh, Nurses Amendment Act, but not necessarily from the experiences of these participants who helped get it passed. Um, they are easily identifiable if you, if, between each other, if I said to someone this story, a lot of people might know that story already because they're quite a close knit group. Um, so I just needed to make sure that I was clear in my justification for why it was appropriate for me to be calling or emailing midwives directly. I think that one of the things that sets midwives separate from other practitioners like a GP, for example, is they would don't usually have a medical receptionist, even calling your hairdresser, you might just get the receptionist versus just the person that does your hair. So midwives were used to being cold called about their caseload or do they have space for this? Um, you know, when, when we get pregnant, uh, are you available in October or something like that? So the justification I needed to make to the ethics committee. Next slide, please. So overall, I identified 40 participants, 19 were interviewed, uh, 13 in individual interviews and two uh, group interviews, and they were very good at uh, organizing themselves. So that was very helpful for me. 14 midwives and five consumers. And I'm not going to be talking a lot about what consumers said in this talk. Um, but overall, I have I'm wading through over 450 pages of raw data, which is so amazing. And I'm really, really grateful. And this slide next to this just shows the wide variety of knowledge and experience of the participants. So it's the red is telling us that they were direct, uh, that they were uh, domiciliary midwives. The blue is that they worked alongside the Home Birth Association or purple, save the midwives. Green is saying that they were involved with College of Midwives at any point. And the blue next to that is that they were an independent LMC midwife. The mustard color and brown, I'm not sure why those are two separate colors, so it shows that the midwives worked within the education of midwifery or of midwives in direct entry. And the purple shows us who had who has received a PhD. And then the other two show uh, the midwives or consumers that were also involved with other extracurricular groups or committees um, as a representative of the midwifery uh, profession. And we can go to the next slide. So my data collection, I was given the go-ahead on uh, 17th of September, St. Patrick's Day last year. Um, and my first interview was on the 28th of March. This was a very highly um, motivated group and I was finished with my data collection in June. Um, and I went from, this is a uh, National Women's Hospital, down at the bottom here is the Wanganui River, Upper Hut, and I was invited to view a new primary birthing unit in Christchurch. So this just shows around the data collection uh, part of New Zealand. And you can have a read through of those where I went and things. So we can go to the next slide, please. Maybe we can go to the next slide. There we go. Here we are. So with the narrative inquiry, I'm using the tools of temporality, sociality in place to help. <laughs> it really helps me to organize uh, my data and make sense of it. So temporality is just a fancy word for time. Um, this is I'm looking at the profession shaped over time. Um, I'm looking at a historical context with the participants experience um, and if I said, uh, if I was talking about the medications that they used in the 1970s at the hospital, and I was trying to say that that was something that was happening now, we could, would get very confused. So I have to be very uh, clear and explain um, exactly what was happening at what time frame. And sociality is just looking over, over the society over time as well, um, when the events occurred, how they were changing, and it's... Um, it takes one individual, one individual's account, but also brings it to comparing and contrasting what was someone doing in the hospital versus what was somebody doing um, it, at home as a domiciliary midwife and how things shifted over, over time as well. 
But for the sociality, it's sort of the social group of the participants, they were middle class educated Pakiha white women. And I'm very I, aware of that's essentially who I am as well. So the research will be looking at midwifery through that lens. And the place is all of New Zealand from Northland to Nelson. So when I'm looking at place, I'm thinking about things like what hospital culture was in this environment or this hospital culture in that environment? Was it a rural area? Did, were they near the mountains? And so the place really sets the scene for how things transpired. Um, it also could mean the home birth versus a hospital birth. So it could be very literal in where it was, but also what was happening. And we can go to the next slide. I need to breathe. <laughs> so this um, term of terroir is something that came to me through the wine industry, just being around. Um, and it's really helps to, it helped me to understand how I can be reflective within the research journey. And so what is terroir? So a venture or the researcher is looking at a grape and a grapevine and a grape variety and the soil and the air and the climate and all of the factors that the grapes are exposed to before they are processed to this great wine. So essentially what that means for me is that I'm looking at all of my participants as individual grapes and together they make this great uh, thesis or bottle of wine at the end. And what has shaped them is their experience within these different hospitals or home um, and working in these different environments that I showed with the, um, the graphic there, because those are the ways that we'll be able to uh, understand and analyze their perspectives and their experiences. And so this was really a good example for me to sort of put that together so I could understand it. Maybe we can go to the next slide. And this is just the regular data analysis. So I used an inductive analysis. I did a lot of reading of New Zealand midwifery uh, before I started my data collection. But I also read a lot of what the participants had written and a lot of the research they had engaged in to kind of understand where they were coming from. Um, but I did read through the transcripts after I did, uh, wrote them and they came back to me. I pulled threads um, from the transcript story. So it's not like a discourse analysis where I'm focusing on a word and it's not really a thematic analysis where I'm looking at a, a, a theme and creating themes. I'm looking at larger pieces of um, context or a story. So, and you'll see some, I'll have some soon uh, that you could see trying to convey meaning through the uh, participants' words. And so I compare and contrast what people said um, in order to make sense of their meaning. And you can go ahead and change the next slide. Thank you. So what? Yeah, we always say, so what, Aaron, so what? So what did the participants say? We can go to the next one. So this is essentially where we're finally at number 26. This is what you came to talk to hear about. Um, the practitioners talked about learning, unlearning and relearning. So the learning for them, they spoke about, it was mostly the learning in the hospital was rote learning. It was learning how to follow orders, ho follow hospital procedures. If they didn't do that, they were called to account by the charge midwife. They, were got, they got in trouble and they didn't have a lot of midwifery skills. They had developed, uh, they were doing menial tasks that kept them very busy, but not a lot of clinical um, education or, or thinking around it. Um, and then when they were talking about their unlearning and this sort of practice shift is sitting below this, one of the participants said, I gradually started to realize that there was something about women that came in really late to have their babies. We didn't have time to do the shaves and the enema and all the things we had to do to them. There was something magical about those births that we just, that just wasn't there otherwise. I began to think there's something special that happens when we don't get there to mess it up. So I started getting really captivated by what it was that we were doing that shouldn't be done. And another one of the midwives who talked about, she wanted, she heard Joan Donnelly was going and doing these home births and she thought, I want to go with 
do these home births. But when she had first heard the word home birth together, she was like, what is that? I've never heard of that before. That's so weird. So she wrote to Joan to ask if she could attend births with her and they rock up to the house and the woman, she thought, oh, she can't be in labor. And she thought that she couldn't be in labor because she wasn't screaming and she wasn't. And because what her experience was, is that women were screaming in on the maternity ward or climbing the bed. And it just sounded really not very nice to work in a maternity uh, ward at that time. So she, they get to the house. She doesn't think the woman's in labor, but she's in fact five centimeters dilated and she, and people were coming in and bringing food. And she thought, what is going on? This is so different to what, what her experience had been in the hospital. So they were exposed to a different birthing process, a different, and they talked about the process of birth. They started to question their own practice and they reflected on their practice. And then when they were relearning by going to these home births, they, it was a very gradual process. They learned things, um, each birth they went to, oh, I can bring one of those tools or I can bring this tool or I can, that might be nice. And it required them to step back from their practice and think about what they were doing and thinking, um, and I'll have a quote in a moment about specifically that, but they also were in a very supportive environment at home. So they had a supportive GP or they had the consumer, which I won't talk about, like I said, but the consumers were very supported and they had a reciprocal relationship with the midwives to say, we're okay, this is great. Thank you so much for helping me have this birth that I wanted, and I'm really appreciative. So it was a very supportive environment for everyone to be learning, the, the women having the babies and also the midwives. Um, one of the participants said that she was at a birth in Devonport on the North Shore of Auckland, and she was there, and the woman was three centimeters and three centimeters and three centimeters. So she called the doctor thinking the doctor would come over and say, okay, we should go to the hospital. And the doctor just said, oh, let's just put it in a drip. And she was just like, oh my gosh, what a surprise. She thought we surely have to do something. But the support from the GP saying, um, no, we'll just do a drip at home. She just was so surprised she couldn't believe that. Um, and this is one of the participants saying, to actually change your practice requires you to do something different. So if you've developed a particular way of practicing, but now you need to change it, that requires a lot of effort and it requires you stepping back. And so that sort of came through with the um, previous slide. Next slide, please. And this is the one of uh, the example that I was just saying that you'd hear about. So it says, and I can remember standing at home thinking, oh, this is such a shame. She's making progress and we're nearly there. The two hours is up. We'll have to go to the hospital. What a shame. And then she suddenly thought, hang on a minute. Who made that up? Because it was so entrenched in the thinking and in the clinical practice and in the, and the clinical delivery. Um, who made up that? Some guy. And it's not just some guy. It's sort of this guy, you know, this kind of the person in the earlier of my slides, the, it's the institution, it's the protocols, it's the hospital. So then she kind of came around and she thought, no, we're not going into the hospital. And so, and she says, so you had to start learning and unlearning and learning some more. Next slide, please. Another participant said, and so I think for me, moving from hospital birth to being a home birth midwife is my biggest achievement personally, because I shifted my whole paradigm. When I first did midwifery home birth, we were taught it was selfish and evil. And I love that she explains selfish and evil as, you know, bad patients, uh, bad consumers, the women choosing a home birth, they're, they're selfish because they're only thinking of themselves. But if we look at the the hospital system at that time, that was the only way they could have the birth that they wanted. Um, and they did, they were being very, they were making really good decisions about it. They were doing their own education. They were very responsible for themselves, but the system said they were selfish and the, and the midwives were evil for supporting them. So what's the best way to really keep people to behave in the way that they are supposed to is by saying that they're selfish and evil. And there was a lot of animosity between the, mid, the domiciliary midwives and the hospital midwives at that time. And we can go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so I'm going to fast forward and the act has passed and there was a lot of work around that and um, and I and I just can't talk about it, although I could, but I don't have the time. So that'll be another um, presentation at some point. Um, but with the act passing and the other, um, we what happened is it changed the culture around birth. And it allowed that some of the domiciliary midwives, the th way that they were behaving and the way that they were practicing then became sort of more acceptable by the institution. So we can go to our next slide. Excuse me. So it says, and then the exodus of midwives came from the hospital, they'd bring all their women into the hospital to have their babies, or they'd work with obstetricians. And another participant said, we call them medwives. So what, what had happened was a lot of the midwives could see that, oh, the act change, I can go out and, and have a whole scope of practice. And, um, but they didn't do the unlearning and the relearning. So they really still practiced in the way that they had in the hospital. And they were very comfortable in the hospital. And because a lot of the primary units around the country had been closing down, their own, the options were in some areas, home birth or hospital birth. And so with those choices, a lot of women who were pregnant at that time, they didn't, they knew, oh, I can have a midwife and oh, I'll have the continuity of care, but they didn't really recognize that what that meant was for them, they could have the birth that the midwife sort of continued to manage more than they had the ability to say, they would say what they wanted and they still had that. And they had the practitioner there that they had em employed to and had a relationship with. Um, but they didn't necessarily have the birth that they wanted and, unless they were at home. So we can go to the next slide, please. So after the Nurses Amendment Act, um, I like this picture because it's still the institution and there's still um, the design flaw that's still on the other side. People continued to have home births and the home birth rate did increase in some areas like in the Manawa too. Um, but at the, in the main, people continued to go to the hospital. Um, one of the participants mentioned that the hospitals were supposed to take on and be the uh, independent midwife or the lead maternity carer for women of high risk or pre-existing health concerns, but they didn't tend to do that. They didn't pick that up. They just sort of took everyone because it's easier to look after normal, uh, healthy women, isn't it? So they never really uh, did that. But the core midwives, uh, some of them came out, they left the hospital, they brought labor, laboring women back into the hospital. But even when the domiciliary midwives would come into the hospital, because now they could access the hospital with an access agreement, um, their treatment of them was better than it had been previously, but it was still quite bad. One of the participants talked about she had a labor and there, the woman was experiencing a shoulder, shoulder dystocia. So she said to the two midwives, can you go get the doctor? And one of them went to go get the doctor and then and another one stood there and sort of smiled at her wa watching to see what she was going to do instead of helping. And she thought, well, surely she's not going to allow someone to get hurt because of this thing that we have between us. Um, so they hadn't really experienced that practice shift like the domiciliary midwives had. And and I'm not going to talk about what happened next, but we'll just go to my next slide. Is this the same thing? Okay. <laughs> so as I said, the um, case loading uh, domiciliary midwives were able to access the hospital if they wanted to or needed to. Um, but they some of the participants w went into the system to change the system to their own detriment. So there was one participant who went to a hospital that had a lot of private obstetricians um, in order to open it up for midwives and open it up for families, as she said. But she was only there for a short period because they had such a strong private obstet obstetric community um, that it wasn't really viable for her for much longer. So as soon as she moved on to somewhere else, it sort of closed up again in the same way. Um, and I have here that the... Ministry of Health and College of Midwives continued working for pay, and that continues, but I'm not going to go into that too much today. One of the other things that um, the A participant was talking about was she said that the, the midwives in the hospital thought the domiciliary midwives were quite dangerous, and she said it was very judgmental, and it 
came from a place she thought that it was the domiciliary midwives were defying the rules um, and that 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 midwife had a lot of empathy for the other midwives who hadn't gone through that process because she understood what that felt like. But so there was a lot of empathy from some of the domiciliary midwives to the the their colleagues who hadn't had that experience. And we can go through the next slide. So my results are still in progress. This is why I'm so excited today to be uh, opening the discussion. I really welcome your feedback, negative feedback in writing, please. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I'm really looking forward to um, hearing your thoughts. Um, and I do have one last slide before we go, which is a bit of foreshadowing. So we can go to that one, Cecilia. Thank you. So essentially, this is, like I said, is, this isn't necessarily within the, that first chapter. It sort of gives us a little idea of what is to come. Um, and this one par uh, participant said, and then in the end, I wound up looking after women with epidurals and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, slowly, it starts to become part of the normality of birth, really. And then with all that, the fear starts to inch back into your thinking. And I guess quite rightly so, because once you start those interventions and you tip the balance of what's happening, then you're opening the door to complication, really. And so I think that you probably do need to be a little bit fearful with what you do. Now, as a practitioner, I read that and I think, Ooh, I understand that and I can un and I feel that reflective practice happening in that moment and making those clinical decisions. But what I love about this quote as a researcher um, is that even though we're talking about an epidural at the very beginning of this quote, and it, she's saying it slowly starts to become part of your of normality. So even though it's common, it's not normal, but it's the standard of practice. And that's what I really find very fascinating about this. And then the fear starts to inch back into your thinking. So you're then practicing a little bit more defensively again, which I think is very interesting as well. And this emphasis that I've added here is you're opening the door to complications. And so I know that we all understand the cascade of interventions, that poster, and we all talk about it. I think that this is a really great reflection about our own practice and making decisions in the moment with that support with um, the time and with the resources to be able to look at the evidence of normal birth versus the standard of care that tends to happen. And I'm not going to go too deeply into this because of this, I'm really posing this question to you um, to have a, a general, more general conversation. So I will stop now and you can go to my next slide, which is my references, and we can have a conversation. I think do I have another slide after that? Oh yeah, my next slide uh, is my contact details for those negative comments. <laughs> so kia ora, and thank you so much for listening to me rattle on.